<laughs> nice. Uh, it, I think it's because I'm on an old computer and um, I turned off I turned off the denoise. It was like you know the denoise was causing lots of extra noise for some reason. Oh, maybe you, you had the D D noise on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was in the settings, but uh, I, I think it's because my stuff's so old. But it was fun because um, it started happening at work that same day. So we're trying to have a Zoom meeting at work, and there's it looks like <laughs> you know the video is coming in from the ring or something. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got the guys like frozen in black and white, like high contrast. I'm like, what's 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 going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my reality is deteriorating. Yeah, Zoom is MK altering us all now, I guess. <laughs> That's my guess, at least. That's the only reasonable guess. <laughs> okay, really? um, let me bring up my notes really quick. Um, I do have to do a hard out in an hour and a half this time. So okay. There you go, my notes. Okay, well, I'll just intro, and I guess we'll jump on into it today. Well, there <clears throat> Hello, welcome to the Occult Disney Podcast, where we dive into the hidden Mickeys behind the magic. I'm going to say it a different way every time, because I can never remember how I put the order of words together. But <laughs> as always, this is Matt here. Joining me is Thomas, the Paranoid American. Hi, how are you? That's me. I'm still paranoid as ever. All right. Oh, you get to wear short sleeves. Wait, what's the temperature in Florida? Uh, we're 70s today. Okay. I've been in a deep freeze for weeks, so I want to hear about your 70s. <laughs> yeah, cold here is 50. Yeah, I, I, am, well, I think we got minus... Yeah, I was walking home and it was minus zero last week. My hands froze. It's exciting. <laughs> or was it plus zero? Well, I am trying to, like, <laughs> trying to negotiate uh celsius and fahrenheit here i've I've forgotten all of the american measurements now so <laughs> i finally stopped being well you really got to go to kelvin because if if we all if we all work on kelvin then there can be like an international standard yep yep that's that's the um argument for climate change right we're gonna have to switch to kelvins and everyone's gonna be confused just think of how inconvenient <laughs> that will be an inconvenient truth <laughs> that's not today's movie though um that I don't think that would be a fun one. Um, <laughs> it's it's a much more fun one, which is Mary Poppins. And I think I mentioned to you, I this was actually the first time I watched this. I that's I, that's interesting to me because uh, I remember this one as being the movie that no one really had. It was like everyone's cousin had this movie, so you would go to like a cousin's house and they'd have it on. Uh, and it's also one of those movies that I don't remember ever watching beginning the, i'm sure i have a million times but seeing beginning the end it was always just like a movie that would be on and you'd kind of like catch little glimpses of it and like certain scenes were more memorable than others you know i think i would only see like you know the clips that they would put in disney retrospectives or everyone something. remembers the dancing penguins and the flying through the air with the uh, and um what the chim chimney song and spoonful of sugar but but a lot of the other ones kind of caught me by surprise that i had a you know was i going through one of those berenstein bear mandala effect moments or not <laughs> well i guess we just call those the, the lesser songs i don't know but um yeah obviously i know like five of the songs from this despite having not actually watched it before um i, th I think it's twofold one i was an only child and you know to a young boy mary poppins is like ooh, that's a girl's movie right um so i had that going so I had no sister to make me watch it um or even and it probably would have been dated that. for for both of us too as young kids well the weird one and we'll get to it soon i remember renting bed knobs and broomsticks like several times which is i has i guess that's kind of the reputation for the like watered down mary poppins now you know <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess so. That's that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> like they tried the formula again and it was like medium strength only because I think that movie was like mildly successful. Whereas this one was the number, the top grossing Disney movie up to this point and uh, the number one box office movie of the year. So, you know, it's a, it a big deal, right? At the time, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, other than what I have watched several times is the uh, clip on YouTube of uh, Scary Mary. Have you have you come across that one? I have not. What is this? It's it's what, just one that's about 
I don't know, 12 years or so is popular on YouTube. It's kind of the fad to recut trailers. You have The Shining as a family okay. comedy. So someone recuts um, Mary Poppins as a uh, horror movie. So It's he, not too much of a stretch, to be honest. No, no, it works. Basically, she's a witch. Yeah, it works, like, really, really well. So... <laughs> And and honestly, if the parents really knew what she was doing with these kids, they'd probably be pretty horrified. Well, she has. I mean, she... She'd be in jail. She'd be in jail in modern days. If, if this was <laughs> Mary Poppins was an actual nanny and you caught her on the nanny cam, she'd be in jail. Yeah, yeah. We've had a lot of um, nanny related incidents in Japan recently, which unfortunately is usually leaving the kids in the car and forgetting about them. So it's kind of uh, much darker than Mary Poppins, much scarier than that. But uh yeah, that's it's weird the news that comes up in uh Japan. I guess there's not as much crime stuff. So um here if you riff for a moment, I'm I'm gonna just find a fantastic headline I saw yesterday. I gotta grab my phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well no problem. I um so what I usually do is look into the background and the story of the writers and the origins of the books and um luckily this time there wasn't anything super dark that would ruin this movie for me. Although kind of like you, this wasn't necessarily one of my favorite movies. So there wasn't a lot to ruin, but I'm happy to report that there was uh there was no like inappropriate adult child relationships in the backstory of this particular movie. Uh, unless you follow some of the biographies of like the child actors that said some of the, the main actors in the movie, uh, you know, acted very adult around them. So that was kind of interesting. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, I guess, like you said, Mary herself is doing some inappropriate child-adult relations on screen, but... <laughs> well, appara apparently Julie Andrews had the mouth of a sailor and just chain-smoked cigarettes nonstop. Uh, the, the young girl in her memoir, she kind of wrote that, like, the first couple of days, everyone was really well-behaved around these child actors, but... Over time, it was just like they weren't even there, and you know, adult adult behavior came out in full force. <laughs> uh, sorry, here's the promised headline. This is uh, my favorite headline as of February third here, um, 2023. Uh, just to tell you, Nico is a um, famous tourist town in Japan. We have Groper arrested in Nico insists he did not grab both breasts but just one. Is that does that carry half the sentence? Here we go. Yeah, yeah, just just one. It's it's fine. Do they, do they charge you per breast? Well, that I, that sounds like his argument. <laughs> what is it? Is it like two? What if you use one hand to to grab both at the same time versus two hands to grab one? You should be this guy's defense lawyer. <laughs> I should <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, just pull um... pick apart the entire legal system. Anyway, that was like the third headline down yesterday, so I guess not that much is going on in Japan. <laughs> that that would not. Yeah, we make we can trade for Orlando headlines for sure. Orlando <laughs> headlines are are not as uh, benign. Right, exactly. So, uh, there's a lot of rappers getting into gang wars uh, around Orlando for some reason this year. <laughs> the, the the infamous Glock Nine, who I'm sure you're extremely familiar with right now, he, he's kind of in the headlines. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, there is, you know, certain strains of pop culture that just do not hit in Japan. For example, I don't think I've seen <laughs> any notable comedy movies for like the past eight years or more. <laughs> do they still make? Oh, comedy well, you should movies? know that right now Dane Cook is is running America. Like there is no comedian as popular as Dane Cook right still? now. Still, right now? No, no, I'm just, I'm ki no, I'm just okay, kidding. Okay, see, I don't know. I seriously don't know. <laughs> like, um, you just plant these seeds, and you can just go around thinking that. Dane Cook is is the new uh, Dave Chappelle. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Well, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, it might be real popular. You know, you, you, can, you can be kind of make some garbage comedy and be popular. I guess. <laughs> um, well, what is it? Well, what one type of comedy that I'm glad has not made a comeback is this uh, slapstick Dick Van Dyke slash Jerry Lewis style comedy that was all over this movie. I my eyes were just constantly rolling in the back of my head. And just and just being thankful that a lot of people think back to these time, you know, 1963, almost golden era, right? The the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s. But man, I would just not like being in a society where this was considered the height of comedy and that this is what everyone would be laughing at. Maybe, maybe that makes me a snob or just uh, crude or crass, but 
uh, I, it just made me feel uncomfortable that people would actually laugh at some of the comedy in this movie. Well, I uh, recently discovered that in at least in 1961, I don't know about 1963, but in 1961, the Three Stooges were still America's number one live act. Their film career is pretty much over, but they were like rock, you know, rock and stages with Curly Joe at that point. And uh, so that was still like that. That's why you're like Dane Cook's number one. I'm like, well, the Three Stooges were number one. In 19- <laughs> I, of course, I like the Three Stooges a lot more than Dane Cook, but uh, yeah. Well, also, and Lenny Bruce was active when this movie came out, so <clears throat> some of that earlier shock stand-up comedy that was just getting its footing was around at the same time that this movie was out. So there's definitely a huge fork in the road between you know different styles of comedy, but obviously the Lenny Bruce style comedy did not get popular for a couple extra decades until after this this movie well, got popular. George Carlin and Richard Pryor were still making polite club humor at this point. <laughs> yeah, right, 63. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, if you ever think about this, yeah. That, this is way off topic. Did you uh, happen to watch that recent uh, George Carlin doc? No. What is it called? I forgot what it's called, but it's pr- quite good. So uh, if, if people are interested in him, I, you know, that and that and get back were my big documentary views of the past year, I guess. <laughs> I saw the Bill Hicks documentary recently and it was really sad. It almost made me tear up. Oh, I'll just keep watching the uh, stand-up routines and then not watch the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just watch the stand-up routine, especially the one where he, he goes in England, I think, like the London stand-ups, probably one of those best ones with the black shirt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that Revolutionary Revol... I don't remember, but yeah, good, that good sound. Stuff. Yeah, that sounds... Repentless, like, re- repentless. Re- Revelations, I think uh, Repentless, repentless. Repentless, I okay. Yeah, I think that's it, but Our yeah, Revelations <laughs> comes because he's got the fire and the cowboy hat. Um, Here, I'm like, well, I guess the... English sort of invented racism, but somehow Dick Van Dyke's um, Bert feels racist for some reason. But uh, there's a significant amount of racism in this movie, for <laughs> sure, man. Some of it that even caught me a little bit off guard. <laughs> I, I definitely liked. Um, what is he? Oh, the British pound has the admiration of the world. I, you know, especially <laughs> in the EU. I mean, this is 1910, right? So I guess it's still like peak. Well, it's just at the. Uh, I guess the sunset of the the real empire phase. I couldn't tell if if they were paying respects to the British Empire or if they were taking jabs at it. And there might have been a little mixture of both. And I'm not just talking about Dick Van Dyke's horrible uh, Cockney accent, but I mean, like some of the actual plot points in the movie, it felt like they were making fun of this aristocratic, old, hoity-toity, crusty, you know, um, sort of like banker image, but they cast it as though that was like the the height of British sort of royalty. They don't even really mention uh, royalty aside from the very beginning when the guy's talking about how much it's a man's world and thank God that um, Andrew is on the throne and and you know so on and so on. And except for Mary Poppins herself, every nanny in the movie looks like she's on death's door. You know. Yeah, they definitely all have the same archetype look to them. <laughs> And uh, and obviously that's to make Mary Poppins stand out as this youthful, you know, the exact opposite end of the spectrum versus all these, you know, crusty, nasty old ladies that the kids don't want because their number one requirement is, you know, she's got to be nice and she has to have fun and play games, <laughs> which are all lies, in my opinion. Mary, she lies about her entire resume. Yeah, that's true. She she does quite a bit of lying. I mean, yeah, she's uh, doing the let's go have fun and then I'll just... I'll, when when your parents question i i go cold it's like oh thanks lady <laughs> and she also completely gaslights these kids she she does things and then immediately denies doing them and does it with such a stone cold face that it doesn't it doesn't seem like she's trying to teach a lesson it really just seems like she's gaslighting them let's uh i guess we should get into the the definition of she's a witch one she lives in the clouds what you can't live in the sky and you can in a Disney movie, of course, but <laughs> I'm just like, I mean, that means that she's, yeah, she's a demon essentially or an angel, I guess, but the, the it's a very thin line between the two. Is, is she like walking between like, you know, the, the veil between this world and the, the astral world, maybe? I mean, the whole painting thing, that seems like kind of a lucid dreaming sort of situation. 
that one was a little scary to me to be honest because there was a line where it was like careful don't smudge the painting and i was just like or what <laughs> does that mean you get trapped inside this land forever although when it rains they just sort of magically appear back in reality but it i was just wondering going on a complete mental you know uh, mind experiment tangent but what if they jump into that painting and then someone comes along and just takes a piece of black chalk and just scribbles all over it are they like trapped inside of the sidewalk forever now and there's a lot of sort of scenarios that i can see horrible things happening to them but i guess if you're just with mary everything just sort of falls into place what could it happen this uh it could be like duck a muck where the, the the people outside the screen start messing around with them we got that um <laughs> now where they did smudge the painting so of course they had you know 35 years more of effects by that point but uh, what dreams may come has some fun painting uh, imagery as they're globbing this landscape and throwing it at each other. Don't get that in <laughs> Mary Poppins. <laughs> but yeah, I did, I guess for me, that is the most fascinating sequence. One, because it starts off still being relatively live action and then and the animated elements start coming in and then you start to get to whole sequences that are completely animated. So this is just for a minute or two, but I, I thought that was kind of interesting because um you know song of the south when we we skipped on very much on purpose um <laughs> you know that's live action or animation for the most part so this one does have it i guess this is the first time that they'd really no disney started his career with the alice cartoons kind of blending animation live action but it's done much better here so i, I gotta say at least as a kid the closest thing that I had to Mary Poppins that I actually cared about was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. That was sort of my version of Mary Poppins because it came out when, you know, I was in the right demographic for it. And I remember it just looking absolutely realistic at the time. And even going back and watching it now, it, it they put good. a lot of effort into it. It still holds up pretty well. Mary Poppins, on the other hand, uh, it, it's hard for me to look back because obviously I didn't it didn't come out when I was a kid it came out when my parents were little kids but I wonder people watching it if they got that same feeling of like oh my god it's so real they're actually in a cartoon or if there was you know people like eh, it doesn't look as good as Snow White did <laughs> you know because that was sort of what I felt like a majority of the time when I saw any sort of animated element on the movie I just kept thinking about how how uh, inferior it looked to every other movie that we've seen so far. I guess I was just like, oh, there's some animation. And uh, what I was noticing more was the, like, kind of the um, the practical effects, like as she's telekinetically flipping all the, you know, uh, drawers and stuff in the room, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, when she has her magical bag and she's pulling huge things out of it, you can almost see like a chromatic aberration around the inside of the table legs where they were doing some kind of fancy green screen footwork or something, or like right, mirrors right. or. But I, I really like that for you know again you're now you can see a little compositing where you're like oh that's pretty ingenious I, I like how they did that so. Um... But yeah, yeah for, and, for the time I would have bought it, I would have absolutely thought that there was a magic bag out there. So I would have fallen. Where's the magic bag? Um, how long do we believe that there were hoverboards out there after Back to the Future 2? I think it was a good 15 <laughs> years before people accepted that that was not quite a real thing. <laughs> I think it might still be a real thing. You never know. Well, they make those ones now that have like, but it's not it's not that one, you know? <laughs> Well, from what I understand, it, it's not the board that would prevent that from working. It's that you would have to have this magnet pathway buried underground everywhere in order for that board to always work. Like You can't just have a magnet that's just always resisting against the earth, you know, in its neutral state. Um, but I no. think you I mean, if, if you had the right environment and you could make one of those yourself, you could put one together in your in your house if you really wanted to. Your, none of your electronics might work the same way, but. <laughs> I'm going to run for office on that platform that our <laughs> infra infrastructure will be re-adapted for uh, hoverboards. <laughs> At least in America, if, if someone ran for president and they came up to the podium riding a Back to the Future hoverboard, I think they would get at least 5% of the vote. They'd get my vote. There we go. Um, let's. I guess we should think a little bit about the, the original book, which... But both of us, I guess for me, since it was the first time I was watching it, you know, I didn't 
delve into uh was it paging mr banks or mary poppins returns or anything like that so sometimes we focus on the remakes but today we're pretty much putting our square on this particular movie which had also been uh under disney's hand for like 25 years i guess or, or you've been trying to buy this about the same time as snow white originally because his kids like the book i think Kids like the book, I guess. Although on on top of that, this one actually has all sorts of direct esoteric references, not ones that you have to dig in and ferret out and, and really, you know, make big assumptions. But the the author of the original book, Pamela Lyndon Travers, she was a close friend of George William Russell, who was member of the Theosophical Society. She was a friend of W. B. Yeats. Um, Yates, um, who was interestingly like a fascist slash nationalist slash occultist, which is a sort of a fun little combination. And she was also a friend and I guess a disciple of Gurdjieff, um, along with uh, Carl Gustav Jung. She 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 uh, learned directly from him. He taught her directly. And Jung is sort of one of the forefathers of modern Western occultism in my mind. And if and if just who her friends were and the people that she kept company with isn't convincing enough, she's also got a crater named after her on Mercury. Um, so so apparently her belief in all of these esoteric um, sort of like research and topics, along with her success with this Mary Poppins book, had basically, you know, she is now immortalized in planetary craters. So I think that she'd be delighted in that, and it fits very well into this the weird occult uh, sort of aspects of this story and movie. Yeah, but did she live in the sky? Um, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably yes. Well, I mean... she she uh, her her uh, family or her friends were also involved in the intelligence uh, agencies of the time. So I mean, in, in that case, you know that that all seeing eye in the sky. Yeah, she was part of it. Well, yeah, there's that weird, like, kind of gray area between, um, you know, the intelligence community and occultism, where in Hollywood, in Hollywood, you know, a lot of times you can't really. It's hard to draw exactly the line on Crowley. I think that's one of the things that makes him fascinating, at least. That it's like, how much of this was him, like, you know, putting on a show, and how much was he like into, you know? <laughs> I think it's a little both, man. Over the years, I've become less of a skeptic and more of a believer in that specifically that Crowley was being very literal in the things that he wrote about. And it wasn't all just being over the top. He was just, he was kind of annoying in that way that he would, you know, a huge self promoter and he would promote all the crazy stuff he was doing, but I do believe he was actually doing it. Yeah. Like maybe the, uh, the intelligence community was just kind of weaponizing him a bit. Like, Hey, go, if you're going to do your weird stuff, go, go do it in New York. Well, that's what they please. do. Right. The, yeah. What the intelligence agency is great at is being like, Oh, I like what you're doing over there here's some money and then just give me the results. Like I'll keep funding your little project, but don't pub, you know, don't publish anything publicly. Don't tell your friends, don't tell any other country, just tell me directly and I'll keep the money flowing. Uh, and if you do tell anyone else, you might die. Uh, and that's yeah. sort of how the intelligence agency, you know, still works today. I think. Well, um, I think I mentioned, I'm currently doing another podcast about the TV show, the prisoner, which is, answer right. to patrick <laughs> mcguin's question like well what happens after the spies retire oh they get, get set up with the house and all that sort of stuff so you know the whole show is basically just them trying to figure out why he left <laughs> <laughs> or wanted to leave i guess he doesn't really get to leave in the end does he <laughs> um so i was looking through your notes that you sent me on this and funny enough we both pretty much had the same note which was two hours and 19 minutes you know like come on <laughs> which is kind of funny because all the movies so far have been a very nice tight 50 to 70 ish minutes right and this is the first one it's like nope we're gonna double that so right. i was i was almost not looking as forward to this one but you know it is what it was yeah once it started like tripping out i, I was I mean, like, yeah, it's not my favorite Disney movie by any means, but one I didn't, I didn't know just how tripped out it did get. You know how magical, and then we can talk about you know what that means in a little more detail as we go. But uh, it's a weird movie, and I like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a weird movie. It had a bunch of weird people in it. It's a lot of tragedy behind it. Apparently, 
at this point, Dick Van Dyke was a suicidal alcoholic during his filming of this. Um, again, Julie Andrews, this was sort of the, the peak of her career, more or less. Um, she kind of wrote off of the, the fame of Mary Poppins as much as any other um, work that she was in. And then, unfortunately, the little kid, I guess he got he took his money from the movie and went to India and depending on the source, either ate bad meat or was um, shooting up heroin with dirty needles and either way got um, some sort of a horrible pancreatic disease, not cancer, but like necrosis of the pancreas. Like it was a horrible sounding way to go. And he died at 21, I think. Um, and the dad, he had just recovered from his wife who jumped off a building with their two children. So the, there's all kinds of really horrible, dark, sad things that are going on in the lives of all of the people that are starring in the movie and just acting happy and singing and dancing the whole time. So that's always an interesting side note to realize that these people that you remember and you sing along to all their songs, they were going through some horrible personal tragedies or were about to. Yeah, there is a lot of weird, dark stuff on a lot of the uh, 60s media. Like uh, with the Twilight Zone, we found, especially in season one, like there were just all these Hollywood Babylon cases. Um, and then I, I, I have my co-host do the, the Prisoner um, trivia. And like every week he's like, this guest star, this was their final film role. They died in 1968, you know? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what's going on here? I guess they all got sent off to the village or something. So Or curse, man. Yeah, there's got to be a, like a Hollywood curse with all this. I mean, I guess if we broke down modern films, you'd find just as much darkness on a lot of this stuff. But uh, so maybe it just needs a few decades to uh, become part of the public record. I, I don't know. One well, plus, if if you're in a Hollywood movie, people care a little bit more about the rest of the things that you do with your life. Whereas just like a normal Joe Schmo might be going through the same dark battles and experiences, but no one really cares unless you were more than an extra in a movie, right? Yeah, I feel like, like you can't really have a film star anymore where their um opinions and it's like you have to know their opinions right like politically and all of that sort of thing it needs to be on the record now where I feel oh like yeah they... before before i'll even consider a movie now they have to go through the entire litmus purity test on every political stance i've ever held they have to align with everything <laughs> which again is why dane cook is the only remaining comedian here in the states <laughs> You know, we all think Harrison Ford seems grumpy on interview shows and stuff, but he's, um, you know, he's smart. Nobody can understand what his views are because he's just mumbling and grunting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that might actually star. be a legitimate view for m most things, to just, just like rumble and grunt. That's, That's an actual legitimate stance. Well, that is one thing in Japan, like, it's still, the culture is still like, don't give people your opinions. So... Well, my podcast, I, I give a fair amount of opinions, but in general, I, I call so not lately. big bumper sticker people, I assume. Oh, you very rarely see a bumper <laughs> sticker. I, I definitely never see the uh, the. It's, it's funny part. because, I mean, at least in Florida, you can tell someone's entire political and social opinions by the time you've gotten close enough to read their license plate. Or at least for the most part, you, you see the Apple sticker, you see the coexist sticker, you see uh, a Second Amendment sticker, you see the, the Calvin and Hobbes where he's like peeing on something that he doesn't like. Uh, it's Sometimes it's kind of nice, right? You know, like what areas to avoid just based on the bumper stickers that you see. <laughs> now, um, Japan, um, what, the streets are weirdly boring, like 80% of the cars are white with no stickers. There, there's a, Sounds like that, a fever dream. It, again, that's the thing. The, everyone buys a white car because they don't want to stand out. There's the um. Are you sure you don't live in an AI generated painting? <laughs> the the, the uh, there's a quote that translates to or a a prov not a proverb but a saying that uh, the you know the nail that stands up must be hammered down. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's sort of that that line of thinking. So. I do like that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's um like. Yeah, I teach kids, so a lot of times there'll be an elementary school kid who's just kind of like, you know, like kid with attitude. Can be fun sometimes. Sometimes he, if they're a little, you know, a little shit, then not so great. But uh, some of them are just like too energetic and I have to deal with them, but they're kind of fun. They get to junior high and within a few months, they're just like, they've, you know, they've been uh, McMurphy, like in Cuckoo's Nest or something. Could, could this be a situation where like the, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, where if 
if someone just goes and they're just completely rambunctious and like TikTok star in the making, could they just dominate the classroom or would, would everyone just like ostracize and ignore them? Or would it actually generate interest? You know what I mean? Like to be the one person that's just always acting crazy. That usually, yeah, that doesn't go down well. Uh, it doesn't go down well. <laughs> I, I live, you know, I live in the mountains. So here definitely would not go down well. I'm, I'm just thinking in Tokyo. I mean, I, you know, there's famous people in Japan. They have to start somewhere. So, uh, but yeah, I feel like maybe a school in Tokyo is a little bit less strict. <laughs> is that the word? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Um, of course, Mary, Mary here is not very strict at all. She lets the kids go nuts. I mean, if you're walking down the street with the, you know, these kids running circles around her, you'd, you'd probably not have a good impression watching this from the no, outside. No, and she doesn't, in my opinion, she doesn't teach a single good lesson. Every lesson she teaches them is a horrible lesson to learn uh, on multiple levels. And again, borderline illegal and dangerous on almost every single occasion but I'll, I'll give one example is that for some reason disney is absolutely fascinated with using magic to do menial chores i don't know why this is such a recurring theme where you've got the ability to manifest energy and change matter and change reality and for some reason it always goes right to making the beds and putting away dishes and cleaning the kitchen. Uh, I want to understand. I, I guess maybe that was just the bane of uh, the existence for many people, you know, homemakers and children that were around all the time. But I just feel like if I knew magic, I'd be doing so many cooler things than making my bed with them. And in this case, again, they're teaching these kids like, oh, no, don't worry about responsibilities or cleaning up after yourself. You just sing a little song and do a spell and things just clean themselves up. And then while they're cleaning themselves up, we can just go on in this crazy and fun adventure and not worry about any responsibilities in the real world. Well, she does get the job by destroying the competition and then, you know, extensively lying. So not not a good first foot forward there. And also, as all of the original nannies are flying away, I couldn't help but notice there was no screaming. There was no gasping. They all they were all sort of like, oh, Mary's doing this thing again. Damn it. She keeps stealing these jobs from us. Like they, they were all very accepting of the fact they were just getting sucked up into the sky. They'd given up on life. That's why the <laughs> family was having trouble getting a decent nanny. <laughs> <laughs> Only the suicidal nannies. <laughs> are you going to take care of the kids if you're if you if you finished uh, with your with your own? <laughs> I'm sitting here looking for her other lessons. If I put those in my notes, so we got yeah we got the one of um, destroy the competition, lie to get the job. Oh yeah, um, all the met the, the spoonful of sugar um, to make the medicine. I was like, well, nineteen ten, the medicine's probably heroin. <laughs> Her yeah, uh, heroin, uh, all sorts of opiates. It's probably something really horrible for you. But again, this was a, a really horrible message as I was interpreting it. And again, I'm I'm watching it from a jaded lens here. But spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. You're talking about propaganda. We're talking about Disney movies. We're talking about taking you know these these horrible facets of life and just literally sugarcoating them a spoonful of sugar and i don't really think that sugarcoating anything has ever been the right thing to do in any instance and then if you want to take the concept of yeah like this could be poison this could be something that you're drugging these kids with and in fact i do believe that the kids do get stone or drunk or high when they go and visit uncle albert and the dude's laughing and he's on top of the ceiling um, and he's, you know, he's high off his gourd. And if you notice, Dick Van Dyke immediately joins him. Right. He also gets high and he starts um, laughing with the kids. With... high. Yeah. Well, well, the kids start to get up and then Mary Poppins pulls them back down. She's like, uh, 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 kids. So she tries her best to keep them off drugs, but she cannot help and, you know, to prevent them from getting into it. So then everyone ends up getting high in that scene. Well, she already gave him heroin. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I guess cocaine. That what I, I don't. Know. What's on the uh, medicine rack in nineteen ten? You can get both, I believe. So probably laudum. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I, I'm just trying to, I, you know, I want to make it sound like modern day. Connected, well, also, I, 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 I couldn't not consider that uh, Uncle Albert was absolutely high on nitrous oxide because in the early nineteen hundreds, that was an actual thing. Is that 
you know, quote unquote scientists and doctors and, and these sort of higher echelon researchers of society would go town to town and you could just pay money to go and get really high off nitrous in these little like traveling nitrous roadshows. And it was almost seen as the uh, the enlightened man's version of, you know, getting drunk or something because only fancy sciencey people got high off nitrous so this i mean and what's this guy doing right he's floating up into the sky and he's laughing uncontrollably and anytime he laughs he flies up into the air so i mean that's this is nitrous we're talking about nitrous as a one for one you don't even have to sort of like stretch to get there yeah and i was like a little surprised i said wow willy wonka pretty much just lifted this right out yeah. <laughs> of this and put in their movie because well, they were all they were all lot. sharing the same stuff they were all doing the same things yeah, Hollywood skag. Well, actually, um, Willy Wonka is weird in that I, it's basically an out of Hollywood production. It was uh started by the food company that you know makes the Wonka bars and stuff. Filmed in Germany, so it was weirdly off the grid. But uh, I'm I didn't sure, know that. That's interesting. I'm, I'm sure some of the creatives would have also you know been working in Hollywood. Kind of like how you know now we have movies like um, Cloud Atlas, where it's like not quite a Hollywood movie. Uh, in that case, I think they needed to go to Germany to just get the funding. So the never ending story, that was actually almost a fully German production. It's kind of surprising. Some of the movies that are not Hollywood. <laughs> I had no idea on that one either. Yeah. yeah. So, well, we just, I, I just podcasted the never ending story like two weeks ago. So I still remember like all the esoteric facts about that one. Um, <laughs> What so? What do you think the um the painting verse is? Is it, it, like I kept thinking lucid dreaming the whole time, and like sort of an astral realm. Uh, there's also the idea that they're just really high and having a hallucination. I think it's probably closer to that one, uh, and also because Dick Van Dyke. I I didn't realize this because looking back, I always assumed he was the chimney sweep and that was his job, but really. He's a busker. He's a painter. He's a homeless guy. Um, he just does what we call a screever. And I had to look up what a screever was. And a screever was essentially someone that just draws chalk on the sidewalk and then begs for money. Like, oh, do you like this picture? Give me some money. Um, so like all of these things, again, imagine you hire a nanny and the nanny's like, great, I'm going to take your kids out to the park and we're just going to hang out with a homeless person all day. Uh, and and this is kind of where they um, immediately go right into this astral projection realm. First, Dick Van Dyke tries to show him how to do it, but you know he's completely out of his gourd already. He's he's drunk on set, so Mary Poppins comes in. She's like, "No, kids, here's how you do the drugs. You know, here's how you get into the astral realm. It's it's that like that park in a take take this little spoonful and uh, <laughs> and we'll meet you there. So. Yeah, I guess, so Mary is pretty much fully fits that. Um, the details are hazy, but yeah, she's she's a witch. What exactly is Bert then? Is he like an observer or something? Because it seems like he's just kind of taking on a different job every day. Uh, I feel like he's the assistant. He he is the homunculus to Mary's sort of like witch source sorcerer role. Whereas she actually knows all the secret formulas. She does the incantations. For example, when they jump into the sidewalk painting, she have to think, you have to wink, and then you have to double blink. And then you close your eyes and jump. So she's talking right there about like, there's the, the spell and um, the announcement of your will. And then the magical actions that you take in order to get there. And she also ends up being sort of the one that t explains to you how the world works. Because once they get in there, Bert's just ready to go and have fun and just start dancing with penguins. But she's letting them know, like, oh, no, don't smudge the painting, you know. And and she also mentions at one point that Bert's um, underneath your blood is blue. And I realized this might have been sort of like a blue blood aristocrat reference. But it also felt like this could have been a magical, almost alchemical reference. So he's basically like a created, magically created assistant, not a. I but believe. It... I mean, I I think that's the way that I interpret it, especially that your blood is blue because that original race of these mythical blue people, which is pretty heavy in you know like Hinduism and and many other sort of cultures, but the concept that Mary might have somehow almost like he's a genie. That might be a, a better way to put it. That he's almost like a jinn 
that she can summon because what else he comes out of these chimneys or he comes, you know, almost like Santa, almost like these mythical creatures that she can just summon. Um, and he's just there for your entertainment and to kind of keep your eye off the prize. He's, he's sort of the distraction here. So I guess we should consider what is Mary's motivation. Cause she, you know, very much inserts herself into this situation and then back out again, also on the, on the uh well literally the uh a shifting of the winds right so it's like what well, i think is... she's she's planning ideas in these children's minds and and if you pay attention she selects some fairly influential children right their mom is is more or less um very active in this suffragette sort of movement and then the dad works at the bank and not all, not just any bank but apparently the bank that was at the heart of the, uh, the Boston Tea Party, or at least got the, the raw end of the Boston Tea Party. So they represent the actual, like, aristocratic British central bank movement, not just some hodunk bank in the middle of nowhere. So she's, she finds the children of these highly influential elite people, and she basically teaches them magic and says, give up on all these responsibilities that your parents are about to teach you. Don't worry about voting and suffragette and banking. Spend your money on homeless people. Take take your tuppence and give it to the bird lady. And that's, you know, that's how society should work. So I almost want to say she's almost planting these ideas of like communism and magic in the children's heads. And by proxy, every child that watches the movie, Disney is doing the very same thing to their kids. The spell continues. So um, Mary Poppins is a bit of a, a Rasputin figure is, is what we're getting at. I think that, and and again, the original author uh, was a disciple of Gurdjieff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to, to link her to Rasputin is not, you know, it's not more than two connections away from that, in my opinion. And I imagine you'd have to like drown Mary like five times before she'd be gone. <laughs> i th i think you'd have to burn her at the stake to be honest <laughs> yeah yeah you could do that what what was with rasputin they like drowned him and then they had to drown him again or something it was some, something insane there <laughs> and that's only if you believe that the the death of the physical body actually killed him oh right right he's probably um living in the in the bulb of the kremlin so i mean if if you were to go down that dark tangent right could you kill mary poppins or do you think that she's got some sort of magical protection or that she's an ethereal being that just came from the sky and that she's basically immortal? Like, do you well, think she even ages? Does Mary Poppins get old? I was just thinking here and you could, if you wanted to do that, that game where you connect all the Pixar movies, um, you, and you could put Mary and the sword and the stone as um, what's her name? The, the witch at the end that Merlin battles with. <laughs> that's 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 the ultimate fate of Mary Poppins, and the timeline doesn't matter because Merlin's going back in time. So why not Mary too? That, honestly, you might be onto something here, man. <laughs> and when she flies up into the sky, she's going to Bermuda. Yeah, why not? I mean, every what know. is it? Every second Tuesday of the month, she has off. <laughs> doing <laughs> what, man? What is she doing on those Tuesdays? Floating on a cloud, getting really high. Going, going to the <laughs> Eastern Star meetings. It sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't heard the term tuppence before, I think. I think this is the first time I got that. So I, I want to, I, I didn't look this up, but I just assumed that tuppence was another way of saying two pence, like a pocket full of two pence, meaning like literally I've got two pence in my pocket, which might have actually been a significant amount at some point in the past. And then two pence was such a common phrase that it became tuppence. Although I might, I'm just, might just making that up, but I feel like that's what it was. I, I had worked out the pens part of these, so that sounds probably about right. Let's go. Let's go with it. <laughs> had I hadn't worked out the two part, so yeah. <laughs> um, something else. She's got kind of um. Well, she's using reverse psychology on the kids to get them to sleep. That's kind of again a little you know disingenuous considering everything else that she's going for the reverse psychology. I also started thinking of uh, since she keeps putting the kids to sleep, um, I, I, th I was thinking of the voice from Dune, where you use the voice to get people to do what what you want them to do. Well, and this not just the voice, but the spice. You know, he who controls the spice controls the world. There, I'm I'm butchering the quote there, but. Spice and Dune was kind of the currency of their entire economy, which was essentially a drug. Right, right. 
but or or NPR if you want to get you know uh no not NPR that's a radio thing uh neuro NLP she's NLPing the kids a fair amount. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, you're not wrong on that either, man. And and that scene where she gives them the reverse psychology about going to sleep, it's immediately after gaslighting them. It's it's where, oh, Mary, we can't possibly go to sleep. Look, you know, we're so excited. We went on those carousels and you won the race. And she's saying, like, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't sound anything like me. And like, oh, haha, you know, you're fine. And, and she's telling them, like, no, seriously, n- none of that happened. What are you even talking about? Go to sleep. And I, it felt weird. Like, I didn't understand the lesson she was teaching them unless it was, like, lie to your parents, right? Like, if this ever comes up, the first rule about Mary Poppins is you don't talk about Mary Poppins. Oh, my last note, which I wrote late at night and forgot I wrote, was um, it, it looks like I decided Bert was more of a shaman. <laughs> A, uh, a little bit of a shaman and and he breaks the 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 fourth wall right he talks directly to the audience in the beginning so in that sense maybe he is a shaman where he's his real world is in the movie and the spirit world is him talking to the viewer out in the future yeah like he's you know conjuring mary sort of as a uh, don juan conjures his various magical creatures in the castaneda book yeah the dynamic right? between the two of them is an interesting one to to kind of sort out who who's the actual magician and who's the assistant because i don't think that they're equal but it's hard to tell who's running the show well i think that's where you know my, my shaman idea complicates it but yeah if you go with the humunculus humunculus idea that he's a creative assistant well that clearly she's in charge and and that makes sense, you know. He's he's a bit of a Igor, Igor, how, whatever you're supposed to say. I mean, with an equally dumb accent when you think about it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think does this win the uh, prize for worst accent in a movie ever? <laughs> oh no, not even cl- not even close. I've heard some really horrible. I- I, I didn't come prepared with a list, but yeah. you know, I've got a few that are on the tip of my tongue that I can't bring out right now. But I've heard some really, really bad accents in movies. This one was How about most more... annoying. <laughs> it was annoying, but also I kind of I liked it for the fact that someone that actually has the real version of the accent might watch this movie and be offended. And that makes me like his accent. Like so, someone with a an actual legitimate Cockney accent would be so annoyed by his annoying version of the Cockney accent, whereas the Cockney accent itself, even its authentic version, is annoying. I just I love it. I love the dynamic there. It's like a, an Ouroboros of annoying Cockney accents. I know it needs to happen. We need to. Someone needs to make one of those uh, YouTube reaction videos, which I generally hate these. But <laughs> sit sit Jason Statham down in front of Mary Poppins and just. Let him go <laughs> off on it. <laughs> yeah, Guy Ritchie. Better. Get have Guy Ritchie re redo some of the scenes from it. <laughs> I just want them to react and get get um angry at it. So, <laughs> so he's um, he's probably not my favorite person in this movie at all. He's got the coolest song for sure. Um, you know the the Chim Chimney and yeah. and on a side note of that, I had to look up some of the I. Every time I heard it, I just was thinking there's no way that this catchy and earwiggy of a song was just spontaneously created for this movie. Among every other song in the entire movie, that one in particular, it just felt like it had so much more. I don't know. It it almost felt like it tapped into like this really deep archetype listener. So I looked into it and it's actually a blend of two very ancient Yiddish folk songs combined. Um, and that, I mean, I don't want to say like, I, I like, aha, I knew it, but I felt like I knew that there was something more than just the Sherman brothers cooking up a cool little, you know, song. This one actually came from like, I believe Russian slash Jewish, you know, Yiddish sort of background. Um, so, and it was, it was fun finding those original ones and listening to modern interpretations and you could absolutely see exactly where some of the most catchy versions and parts of chim chimney actually came from and it's from like a, a crazy song about like a girl that's trying to escape from her village and she enters the the center of a dying star that turns into a comet like it's it's a it's much more complex than oh i'm just here to clean out your chimney you know oh uh, yeah my note there was a zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance uh excuse me motorcycle zen in the art of chimney maintenance gotta get it right and not say the original book title <laughs> but um 
I didn't notice that with that song in particular because I was thinking about how it plays in Japan. Um, so the M and the N sound is Japanese wouldn't really differentiate much with those two. So it comes out sounding in Japan like chin chin and chin and uh, chin chin and um, Japanese is like a, a children's way of saying penis. So. <laughs> 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 so it's just this guy in a funny cockney accent just saying penis over and over yeah yeah which i see plenty <laughs> of kids doing that too but uh <laughs> there's a what's the other one um oh yeah if you dare read the three little pigs to japanese children in english they're gonna giggle when you get to not by the hair of my chinny chin chin so <laughs> <laughs> so it does not translate very well uh the other and, one and speaking of kids picking up the wrong impressions from parts of this movie i, I made this note that uh i i earnestly believe this so in the scene where the the chim chimney song kind of comes from right they go into the house and he's showing michael the little kid like hey look look in, up inside of this dirty chimney there's magic up there and he actually says that it's between the pavement and stars in the chimney sweep world where there's hardly no day and hardly no night. Things are half shadow and always halfway in light. And he's talking about like, that's, that's where you want to go. That's where you want to be. And Michael, you know, peeks his head up in there and he gets sucked up into the chimney and he ends up flying out into the sky and they have this, you know, awesome flying singing adventure. And all I could think of was that 1963, Till now, there had to have been at least one kid that saw this movie and climbed up inside the chimney because they thought it was this big magical world and then either died from it or were horribly, you know, maimed from the experience. That, that, that number has to be more than zero just based on how popular the movie itself is. Yeah, I guess so. So again, oh. a horrible lesson to teach kids is the, the chimney is a magical place that makes you fly. Oh, by the way, um, I, I think I was the one that started saying 1963, but uh, I should correct uh, 64 on this one. Oh, oh man. <laughs> but they could have been filming in 63. I don't know. I feel embarrassed. <laughs> I feel embarrassed we got no, that off. No, I, 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 I said it first, yeah. No, because I was looking at, I was like, when was the sound of music before or after this? And it was a year after in 65. So I was like, oh. Still, like, still 12 months less or uh, less than 12 months after the death of JFK. So. Right, right. That could well, they might have been filming right at that moment, for all we know. Because <laughs> this one obviously needed a lot of post. <laughs> yes, you're not wrong. I would assume they did the, all the live action first. And there, there's also a moment, too, in this in the chimney part where Michael gets sucked up. And um, he, like, I guess he, like, looks into, like, a, a pole or something. And just all this soot just covers in his entire face, right? His entire body and face is covered in black soot. And Dick Van Dyke just like, oh, no, don't worry. It's just good old clean soot, Michael. And I was just thinking they obviously have never heard of Black Lung uh, in 1910 when this movie <laughs> takes place. Uh, because it's not just good clean soot. Like, that will actually end your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it a Zoolander? I think I got the Black Lung. <laughs> <laughs> not to just ramble off with other people's jokes, but... I don't know. It could be magical. You know, he's a he's a magical chimney sweep. So I guess it could be magical soot. You know, like black cocaine or something. And a black tar, more of that black tar heroin. Oh yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> you can have it in a spoonful, or you can have it uh, <laughs> out of the chimney. <laughs> the opium den that makes sense with all of our, our all our visions in this movie. <laughs> that was a a good Savoy Brown song too, right? Just a spoonful. Oh yeah, it was it the blues? I, I'm sure they did. I, I, Cream did the one version as well. Willie Dixon maybe wrote it. I don't quite remember. There, there. That's me being on the spot, but I didn't think of looking at blues standards before we got on air today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, t 1910 so, so London's about as far from the blues as you can get. <laughs> well, we, and we've got a couple other minor characters too that I think are worth bantering about slightly. So there's. Um, the mom, right, Mrs. Winifred Banks, and and maybe to me this wasn't as obvious, and I felt like, oh, their last name is Banks, and it's a banking family, but uh, that was that was one thing that stood out to me. But and also, again, I'm not making groundbreaking observations here, but it's just interesting that she's so preoccupied in being this sort of beacon of light to what she considers the daughters of her daughters, 
and that you know she's going to lead the suffragette movement but she has absolutely no idea what's happening with her kids she's has no like control over anything in her life her house uh her own decisions nothing uh which is just kind of this interesting you know dynamic between the husband who thinks that he's running the show and he also is completely clueless about everything um and again his his uh his original song and all the songs that the dad's part of are just the worst songs in the entire movie by far but he's saying how grand it is to be an englishman in 1910 king edward's on the throne and it's the age of men and he's he calls himself the lord of my castle the sovereign and the liege um so like he clearly has the a diametrically opposed worldview to his uh, wife, and they're both equally neglectful of their kids. And their kids seem like they seem about twenty years older than they should be to have kids of this age, at least in the movie. Well, the people used to look older, right? I learned that from the Twilight Zone. <laughs> it's but all I, soot. Well, I mean, it, late you have kids. Uh, like I think both of my parents. Uh, my grandparents had them like when they're in their late thirties. So, yeah, but the dad here looks like he's late fifties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just, it's not completely unreasonable. I mean, he's been banking his whole life. He's Mr. Banks, right? So, yeah, that's, that's he's true. Been, he was too busy for years to start a family. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess, uh, and again, I did not watch paging Mr. Banks, but I was thinking, I guess he's supposed to be sort of like the um, Walt Disney surrogate sort of guy. <laughs> I mean, he's he's got the look. At I least. see that. I can see yeah. that. You know, he's so occupied with his empire, maybe, you know, and his kids, they're a little bit, like, neglected. And that's why I brought up the idea that um, one of the reasons he won the rights to this is because his daughters were, like, really into the book series. So he's like, oh, I need to buy those. Like, maybe that's how he felt like, oh, I'm paying attention to them because I'm buying this. Even though He's I'm Mr. Working, Banks, yeah. <laughs> even though I'm working, you know, 20-hour days in, in uh, Burbank or whatever. So you'll get your tuppence. Yeah, yeah. So, because <laughs> uh, what what was the Disney method? Slave drive everyone and then give them a bonus when everything was finished, which is different than today when they won't give you the bonus either. So, <laughs> uh, well, it was that combined with "I'll ruin you and you'll never work in this town again or work for anyone else." That was another aspect of it. Or uh, I'll buy up the competition and shut them down so you've got no other option on where to go. So if you burn your bridge with me, you'll never be an animator again and you're going to work in a different career. That was sort of the other strategy that he kind of enacted. Didn't didn't really work then. Okay, so. <laughs> Cause... I mean, no, I mean, honestly, there was a lot of things that he wanted to do that didn't pan out the way that he wanted to just because they were absolutely insane. <laughs> well, I know um, he ended up on the... Um the bullheaded side of a labor dispute in the early forties. And that's pretty much, I guess the point where it's like, okay, Disney's a pretty conservative dude now. <laughs> well, I mean, not, it didn't just start then. I mean, he had been conservative his entire life. Essentially. Right. But that's where his he... public persona really was like, okay, this guy is like kind of a harder edged businessman. Oh yeah. Yeah. 30s, he doesn't he... just, he doesn't just draw funny cartoons. There's an yeah. actual like business shrewd businessman behind all of this. <laughs> Because in the 30s, he, you know, seemed like a jolly guy, right? And after that incident, he, I mean, and even physically, he starts to look a little more like, like Mr. Banks, right? And uh, I probably should have looked in that movie a little bit more. I, I actually didn't even, it kind of flew by the radar for me. I, uh, although I guess it was an Oscar winner in the States, Mr. Banks. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Tom I Hanks. do know what you're talking about, but I but I gotta be honest. The Oscar winning means absolutely nothing. If anything, it's it's like a a demotivator most yeah. of the time. <laughs> you no, know, I'm just trying to think of why um it didn't it never landed on my radar. So, <laughs> so so I've got some notes on in quotes games, and this probably offends me the most is when uh, Mary Poppins shows up, and one of the criteria. Well, again, on the resume that she lied about was that you have to like playing games and lots of fun games and stuff. And that's the first thing. And she's like, all right, you said that you guys like games. Let's go play a game. And the first game is called Well Begun is Half Done, a.k.a. Let's Clean Up Your Room. And I just <laughs> I just remember even as a kid thinking when she first said that, like, you bitch, <laughs> you were lying this entire time. And now I can't trust anything else that you say. What do you mean clean up the room as the game? And if you just make anything a game, right? So 
again, you mentioned NLP, right? One of the core concepts of NLP out of the, the long list of tools and their and their magic little um, carpet bag is the act of reframing. And she's clearly describing the practice of reframing here where she says anything can be a game depending on your point of view and that in any job that needs to be done, you can find an element of fun. And then if you find that fun, then snap, the job is now a game. So again, I'm not trying to be super dark here, but I was like, okay, apply that to, you know, a mortician or a German prison guard or a sewer cleaner or someone that, you know, is forced with testing radioactive, you know, chemicals in their body because they were the unfortunate, unwitting victim of an MK Ultra experiment. Tell me how that person's job can turn into a fun little game. Um, so I feel like this is not a steadfast rule that just applies to every single facet of society, but she says it in such a matter, you know, matter of fact way that uh, I don't trust her anymore. Yeah, I've been sitting here thinking about how I teach. Um, and usually it's like there's a game as a distraction. So like that's the spoonful of sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'll like I'll have the kids do the English and then go to the whiteboard, do a move in the in the game. Of course, from the kids point of view, it's all about the game. Right. Whereas as a teacher, I'm like, no, I'm actually getting you to do the stuff. And usually I'm like working with the next kid while they're doing the game. So for me, I'm not doing the game at all. I'm just <laughs> teaching the kids. <laughs> but uh, that, I guess uh, I was just saying, I guess I'm a little bit guilty of that. It's just like, oh, yeah, we're playing a game. I'm teaching you English. <laughs> But also, even as she's talking about the game being let's clean up the nursery, no one's doing anything. Magic is doing it all. The kids literally are just like zip, zop, zamboop, and the, the table flips itself back over and the clothes automatically fold themselves and they go into the drawers uh, and the dollhouse just uprights itself. And and on top of that, I'm just thinking, who are these you know animal children that somehow like the tables just flipped over and all the chairs are just flipped over. Like what the hell are they doing in this, you know, hoity toity family where they're just flipping tables over. This doesn't seem like these, these two vanilla ass kids. I, I, I was about to say, are the ginger kids going to be able to do this after mom leaves? Uh, mom leaves, Mary leaves. <laughs> Would the mom even know the mom seems completely clueless about everything. So yeah. no one, no one would even realize these kids are have absolutely free reign over the house. And in fact, they've run, the previous nannies out of the house, which I was just thinking, how thin skinned do you have to be for these two vanilla kids to offend you and that you want to run away? Like, what are they even doing? They, they're they the two most boring uh, protagonist children in a Disney movie, maybe ever. I was thinking they might have like a children of the corn village of the damned sort of quality to them. You know, if they stare at you long okay, enough, like your head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> we were riding the carousel all day. What? <laughs> So there's a couple other parts in this game, too, where um, she says that the Robin knows that a song will move the job along. And for whatever reason, I was like, why? Why do Robins sing so often? And, you know, particularly not just any bird, but the Robin song. And actually, the reason why uh, the Robin sings its song is more often than not to repel potential cuckolders, any any potential male mates that'll come and try to take over their nest and raise their children and mate with their wife. So that's the reason why Robin sings. It's not to make a fun little game. It's like, Hey, stay away from my family. Uh, I'll kill you. I'll peck mm -hmm. your eyes out. That's why Robin is actually singing. It has nothing to do with having a fun game. Not such a sweet song. Okay. It's not such a sweet song. No. <laughs> uh, and then, and, and also I was wondering, she says, uh, the bees never tire of buzzing to and fro. They absolutely do. Bees constantly get so tired that they basically just die. They, they pull off onto the side of the road and die out of exhaustion because they've been working too hard. Uh, so absolutely the, the bees tire of buzzing. Uh, and then there's also this interesting scene where Michael uh, gets stuck in the closet and he's screaming, let me out, let me out. Um, but he can't get out of the closet because it keeps shutting him in on it. Uh, and I was wondering, maybe maybe they were doing a little foreshadowing about Michael in this movie world that, you know, he's struggling with being trapped in the closet somehow. <laughs> yeah, I know I wrote something snarky at that part of the movie, but I can't spy the moment. <laughs> um, just getting back to Bert for a second, something we didn't talk about, which is also quite weird, is when all of the other 
chimney sweeps come out of nowhere. So if we are going to say he's a created assistant, a homunculus, does that mean he also made more or that these are no i think those are all the other homunculus uh homunculi of the other wizards and witches across the town yeah okay yeah and they all basically they live in the chimneys i I assume i I was just thinking of multiplicity where the copies keep making copies of themselves (laughs) great michael keaton movie until they become idiots (laughs) (laughs) which is also the premise of uh Oh man, a great uh, the preacher. I don't know if you've ever seen the either the preacher comic series or the preacher TV show, but they are trying to find the original blood of Jesus, you know, from the Holy Grail, and they keep trying to basically clone the original Jesus from you know this original blood from the bloodline, but they they uh, are like missing a few chromosomes, or they like keep adding a couple extra chromosomes. Uh, so every Jesus they make is sort of like a you know, uh, a less developed Jesus, which turns into some comical scenes. There's also the um, the head of the bank, which had me just thinking of Rupert Murdoch for some reason. This is the uh, angry old man, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would say he's probably more uh, Rothschild than Murdoch. Yeah, uh, good being point. the head of of the London Bank. Oh yeah, so, yeah, oh, the, yeah. He he felt like a Nathan Rothschild to me, um, in the same way that he's angry that the uh the bank's children cause a run on the banks and this this was one of the parts like i don't remember the end of the movie talking about um sort of like fractionalized banking and fiat currency and runs on banks and the boston tea party uh that was actually kind of an interesting twist that i didn't remember and i I appreciated it more than i think kids would i don't think most kids love the uh the bank sing song scene but i actually loved it because of what it seemed to be representing which is where i was talking before i couldn't tell if this movie was paying homage or tribute to sort of you know like the the british influence or if they were poking fun at it because very much they're talking about like oh those damned american revolutionaries you know they they ruined our banking business because the you know the boston tea ended up defaulting on that loan and it almost ruined us um, so it was I'm like, oh, those Americans, you know, uh, which is like, hell yeah, <laughs> the, the Americans, they screwed with the bank guys. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like um, there's not so many Christmas presents in Japan, but uh, kids until they're about 20 get like money from relatives for New Year's. Right. So, of course, I'm always asking the, kids the, like, the red envelopes. Right. Or is yeah, that is yeah. that only a Chinese thing or is that? Uh, uh, they're ac- not across cultures. They're not. It's probably the same sort of thing, but not necessarily okay. red envelopes. The white one with um, some New Year stuff on it. But anyway, the main point is, you know, next week at back, I'll ask students like, "What are you going to do with the money?" I'd say a good sixty percent is I'm going to save it. I'm like, for what? I don't know. Like, well, you, now you, yeah, <laughs> now you just have a now you just have a stack of paper. <laughs> but what, what if they're like, I'm going to go give it to the bird lady in the middle of the city? That that would be a fine answer. I'd like to hear that answer sometime. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a great. Well, yeah, it's just we, you know, sometimes kids have like amazing responses, and then sixty percent, <laughs> like I, I know what they're going to say before they say it, you know. <laughs> and who told you about the homeless bird lady? Oh, the nanny. The nanny told me to take my money and give it to her homeless friends in the middle of the city. So again, this this is Mary Poppins telling these kids take your resources and give them to the homeless she is you know she's instilling a sort of magical communism into the the minds of these affluent youth yes yeah i, I think of the story with a uh, dennis wilson the beach boys drummer in the 70s or something walking down highway boulevard giving a homeless guy some money and then telling his friend next to him like you give him some money too he's like why he's like well what i do pays for your salary so <laughs> i get to tell you what to do with it <laughs> so dennis dennis wilson of mary poppin surrogate maybe i don't know and another <laughs> sad story behind that whole band <laughs> uh, yeah well yeah okay yeah this is before he died of course <laughs> of course he did let the manson family live in his house well didn't well first let and then they were just there so <laughs> yeah, they just kind of didn't leave after a while. <laughs> yeah, as as one does. Um, I started spewing out random observations, but maybe I think you had one or two. Uh, I'm I'm there too. Effects. I think I'm in random observation uh, uh mode at this point too. Okay, because sometimes you have the uh the late game uh scorcher. So, 
Uh, I've got a couple fun ones, but yeah, no, honestly, the the only other sort of themed notes I've got were all on Uncle Albert. Um, and actually, yeah, this is I, I mentioned before that this movie had some surprising just bouts of racism out of the middle of nowhere, and it's not just the uh, the the Red Indians that board the Boston Tea Harbor and you know throw the tea into the sea, but as the kids are leaving the home and I think they're going to go out and like buy fish or something. They're, they're going to like do some specific task and Mary Poppins dog comes and interrupts them. And it's like, what's that lassie? You know, someone's trapped in the well and they find out that uncle Albert is having one of these fits. And as they're leaving the house to go to see uncle Albert, their neighbor who is um the, the retired, what is it like boom or something? He's like the retired Royal Navy officer and he's got the cannon on top of his house and everything. And he asked the kids, where are you guys off to digging for buried treasure off to find hot and tots. And when he said that, I like I had to rewind it. Did this guy just ask these children if they're going to go in and slave hot and tots and parade them around the country? Because that's essentially what those British explorers did, right? Like if they were looking for hot and tots, it was because they were going to go in like take the hot and tot from their their native land and basically put them on a traveling road show and charge money at admittance um which is a one of the, like if you just look up the british interaction with hot and tots mm-hmm. that is like the peak of sort of british racism do you know the time i was just thinking here like being i'm too pedantic but this old guy is still too old for that because i think the british uh stopped their slave trading at 1830 well and well and hot and tots didn't necessarily mean slave trade because it was in this like di- it was it was almost like finding a bearded lady and then forcing the bearded lady to go on the road with you it wasn't technically slavery because it didn't fit into the same mold but it was absolutely like immoral and someone got kidnapped in a lot of these instances or you know you would you would find a little wolf boy and the family doesn't know what to do with this poor kid and they're poor um, so it's like, yeah, fine. You can go and join the circus now and make some money that way. So there, there was that aspect to it, but just, just the concept of these, this rich white guy asking this other rich white family, are you off to find impoverished, you know, black natives? What a weird, what a weird, you know, that's the first thing that comes to his mind is these kids are off to find Hottentots. Well, he did turn his house into a boat. So with, he, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the marbles are are very motivated but maybe they're you know bouncing in the wrong way (laughs) oh one more thing on the uh chimney sweep dance there was one shot where i was just like it seemed like they were dancing around the edges of a pyramid how they framed the shot and that just stuck out to me last night i I think it's just one of the roofs behind them but i was like that's kind of a weird esoteric style image (laughs) Yeah, it was it was hard to to make a note of every one of those, but there was a, a lot of as above, so below postures in that exact same dance too with the chimney sweeps. Yeah, I guess that's why I was so fascinated about like who do we think the other ones are. So yeah, I, I like that you know kind of like um we go the Harry Potter idea, right? These are the the their surrogates in the Muggle world or something. Um, well, and also the the chimney sweeps themselves represent this very older form of magic from, I think like the British Isles or so I don't, I don't, I didn't figure out the exact source of it, but the idea. And as Michael was telling his dad, you must be the luckiest guy in the world. Cause he just shook the hand of all these chimney sweeps. And that's because there was this legend that if you brushed up against the side of a chimney sweep sleeve and you got soot on it, or if you shook a chimney sweeps hand, then their luck would rub off on you. Um, so it was actually this sort of magical transference of positive energy, essentially. Although my my more practical, cynical self was just thinking, maybe this is just like the way that they would get people that were cleaning chimneys to not feel like they were just like the absolute bottom rung of society. Like, no, 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 you're not absolute human garbage that I'm just sending up into my chimney to die of black lung. Like, you're lucky. You know, you've got this air of luck about you. You're you're so special. You're so lucky. You know what I mean? Now get up in the chimney and clean that thing. Here's here's just one thought. Um, I was thinking, like, the chimney sweeps are all they're covered in soot but they're clean shaven i was think i think every other male in this movie has you know like a a stylish stash 
they they are very clean for chimney sweeps. Yes. Yeah, but very but suspicious. All the, all the other men in the movie, the bankers and just the men on the street and stuff, they they all have mustaches, whereas the chimney sweeps don't. I'm not sure if that's like a 100 percent correlation, but it, it, there was just one scene where I think it was in the bank. And I was like, oh, everyone's got a mustache. So <laughs> if that's true, man, that actually feeds into my homunculi theory a little bit, because typically a homunculus would not have facial hair. It's it's not a very typical uh, characteristic of a homunculus. Oh, that's a much better payoff. My my um my setup was just going to be that Michael Eisner would would hate 1910 London with all <laughs> facial hair. <laughs> uh, do you have any other uh, any final thoughts you want to throw on this? I've thing? got a couple. Yeah, I've got a, I got a couple of good ones. So one okay. is one is the penguin dance. Uh, wasn't as impressed with the animation as with Dick Van Dyke's dance. This is one of the 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 parts that I enjoyed the most was seeing him dance like the little penguin and just in like a really dumb like you know fart and poop joke kind of way like haha man's dancing funny with his pants pulled down but I actually really enjoyed that but also the song that they're singing as they're doing this dance um it's a, all these different women's names and how they're not as good as Mary and and uh, I, I re-listened to the song like two or three times and not because it's a great song, but I was like, why why is this speaking to me on such a weird sort of nostalgic level? And then it snapped into place that it reminded me of so many songs in the 90s. You had Mamba Kill, number you had five. Mamba number five. <laughs> you had Petey Pablo Freak a Leak. You had DMX with these what these ladies want <laughs> um and then my favorite one which i think i went to was there's a song by too short called cocktails and it's basically this song just restated in slightly more modern terms but it's just like here's a name of a bunch of women and here's the ones that are better than the others which maybe this was one of the original sources of that entire theme of song was from mary poppins so we might not have Mambo number five, cocktails or freak a leak, if it hadn't have been for Mary Poppins, which is just an interesting concept to, to throw around. And we wouldn't have Disney's Mambo number five featuring Lou Vega, <laughs> which they put on their Latin themed album around the year 2000. <laughs> <laughs> You- there could be a, a future Latin remake of Mary Poppins where that song is replaced <laughs> by Mambo Number no. Five. I mean, it's it's within the realm of possibility, and it would be right on theme. So this has a few of these weird albums here. It's the uh, Splash Dance from around 1984, I think, which has like new wave sort of stuff with you know about Minnie Mouse, and then the totally bizarre um, Mickey Unwrapped album from 1994, where they're trying to have Mickey Mouse rap, they're, and Goofy does rap a bit. <laughs> I've never heard about Goofy that. Does. You find and all I, this on YouTube. <laughs> I have to look this up now. That's a splash dance. Mickey, unwrapped. Mickey unwrapped, and <laughs> and one track has Goofy rapping. So, um, it's kind of. And then, weird. I think my let's let me see. Uh, yeah, one of my my final note here, maybe not with a bang, but <laughs> I had, I had no idea that fragile, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. That word in the context of this movie, where they define it, is Mary Poppins talking about how she's the smartest, prettiest, fastest, and bestest person ever. Like, the, because they're asking her, Mary, how does it feel to just be so smart and so beautiful? And, and you're, you just win every race and everything you do is just perfect. They're describing what you would call a Mary Sue, right? A Mary Sue is just like a character that has no faults and just is magical and can just accomplish anything with no real struggle that they have to go through. This describes Mary Poppins to an absolute T and she defines that, that state of being as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, which makes that word almost be the, uh, the embodiment of sort of like white female privilege. Yeah. And also, yeah, she's using as a, just use it to like blow people off, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, wanna, dude. This is why I'm so it. much better. It's the, it is now. I can't hear someone sing that song and like, oh, you're just being condescending. You're just telling everyone how much better you are than them if you're singing the song. <laughs> I was looking for the real longest word, um, but I'm not going to say it because according anti disestablishmentarianism is it not? Uh, it is the chemical composition of 
Tintin, the largest known protein, the largest known protein. I feel like this is cheating. It's already it, cheating because it's just going to string together a whole bunch of different, like, you know, chemical prefixes. Yeah. Okay. That that's a good food point, but it comes out to one hundred eighty nine thousand eight hundred nineteen letters. Okay. So. Yes, yeah, so that's cheating, dude. There's no <laughs> way. No it's one, long... no one in in the reality that we live in ever says that out loud. It's it's like a an academic experiment experiment. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious has thirty four letters. Um, coming in at forty five letters, listed as the longest word in a major dictionary is pneumoneutromic crossbox. Uh, I gave up. Okay, I gave up about twenty letters in. So, it, it's, what, what's it, there's another interesting one. What what um a word that has the most number of double letters in a sequence, I believe, is bookkeeper because it's got o o k k e e. Uh, all right next to each other oh that yeah that okay see that that's, that's so fun obvious one. yeah yeah you expect it's a word that you can't manage right like the one i just failed to say and not gonna try again you can look it up <laughs> <laughs> yeah longest words <laughs> so so final thoughts on this movie from me at least uh it's mary poppins is a liar she's a gaslighter she drugs kids she introduces kids to homeless people she brings them to uncle albert's house and this guy is just constantly doing nitrous or something else nothing that she does with the kids is safe nothing that she teaches them uh improves them in any sort of way their character arcs do not improve um, over the course of the movie that's typically a good story right you meet someone that has faults and then over the course of the movie they go through some sort of self-revelation and struggles and they overcome their faults and become you know better for it none of that happens at any point through this entire movie if anything they deteriorate and become worse people for it the mom <laughs> the dad the kids the chimney sweep just every single person is is worse off after encountering mary poppins and she's almost this like opiate of the masses like no one realizes that her presence is harming them because they're just so fascinated with her white woman privilege and her super califragilistic expialidocious that uh yeah she just kind of pulls the wool over everyone's eyes so there's no redeeming qualities whatsoever about mary poppins in my mind after watching this movie as an outside objective sort of experience so i'll, I'll leave mary. it at that scary mary yeah no when i finished the movie i was like man i'm glad that neither of us have to like do plot summaries for this podcast because i do, <laughs> do them for other ones it was a mary takes a, a witch takes a trial job and decides to not follow through with it i guess i don't know the end <laughs> yeah that's there that's the plot <laughs> um I guess we do need to wrap up today. So is there anything you want to send people to? And I guess it's probably early March-ish. Yeah, uh, honestly, please just check out paranoidamerican.com. I've got links to a lot of the different podcasts that we've done together, along with a whole bunch of original books and comics and coloring books that you won't find anywhere else other than on paranoidamerican.com. Uh, and in particular, I've got an mk ultra booklet that breaks down the entire history of the cia mk ultra project uh, all the way to paperclip and beyond so that's that's probably one of my biggest top sellers that people seem to love the most so i plan on releasing a few more of those pamphlets later this year but uh yeah grab that one while i still got copies at paranoidamerican.com is is a uh, operation midnight climax too too late for that scope uh no actually Operation Midnight Climax was one of the very I think that was MK Ultra Subproject Four it was one of the very first MK Ultra Subprojects and on that one in particular I actually have a a book called Paranoid American History One Hundred One which you can find on the website and on Amazon and that has an entire I think it's like a seven or eight page short story titled Operation Midnight Climax which details all the key players and all of the specific sort of experiments that took place in that particular MK ultra sub project. That's one of my favorite topics by far is that in that one in particular, uh, midnight operation climax. That, definitely my favorite, uh, operation name ever. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, as, as for this, you call it Disney podcast is, um, on the network of Podcastio Podcastius, which you can find on Patreon, where we also talk about science fiction movies, 
The Twilight Zone, The Prisoner, and some video game stuff with Luclos Pokemon, Monster Mash, about Monster Hunter, and the Game Game Show. Okay, there, there's a lot of podcasts there. We're, we're busy bunnies. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I feel the wind is changing, so I'm just going to fly off and everyone I leave behind can bugger off. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go ahead and cut it there. And...